and of the Holy Spirit, glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. The church on this day presents us with two marvelous saints. And we are, of course, unfortunately, we have to make a decision which one to celebrate. But being of the Russian tradition, we choose Saint Sergius, typically. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. The other alternative is Saint Athanasius the Athenite, who was the founder of the great law for and really the beginner of communal monasticism on Mount Athos. Both of them really fulfill what we just heard from Christ in his sermon in Luke, which contrasts a little bit differently than the one in Matthew, which says, Blessed are the poor, blessed are those who hunger, blessed are those who weep now, blessed are those who are persecuted by others. Some of those are similar, of course, in the Gospel of Matthew. But he emphasizes those difficulties and those trials in this world and the glories that they lead to. And we can say it about both of them, because both of them really did live a life of poverty. Saint Sergius, not so much as Saint Athanasius, who came from a background of wealth and rather well-known family, but they both ended up living very poorly. And if you can actually see photographs still, because monks who are tonsured at the Great Lava still for a few days will wear the cross made out of iron that St. Athanasius wore throughout his days. It's, it's a massive thing. I can't remember if it's 20 or 25 pounds. And imagine wearing that rather frequently. A man who was used to comfort, but he didn't live that way ultimately. He was a man of great erudition. He was wise in things that he did. Because this monk, you know, he's a monk who, like many, as St. Sergius, went out to live a life of solitude he has the cave there still of him where many still go and live. Joseph the Hezekiah did so for a while. But he ended up with a flock around him. He even invented a device with mules to uh, grind up wheat so they would have sufficient bread for the monastery, which hadn't existed before. Rather ingenious in the things he would do. He also dies in a way that's not so glorious. We used to these saints' lives many times where something amazing happens, but he falls off scaffolding while building this tremendous monastery that they still have. And he dies that way. And it's a good lesson for all of us. That we never know when our time is and where we're going to go and how. No matter how great we have become, if we think we're great, we're not him because he was humble. And that's what I want to emphasize with Saint Sergius. Today is actually the remembrance of the transfer of his relics. It's not the day of his repose, which is in September 25th, I believe. But this day is the day that he appeared to a man and told them, what are you doing? Why are you treating my relics this way? This was 30 years after his death. This is 1422. He had died in, of course, 1392. And in 1422, he appeared to them and said, there's water coming in near my relics. Do something about it. And they, in fear, did so. And they get there and they found out that everything around the grave was flooded, but not his relics and his vestments and things that he had on. That's when his relics were taken out of the ground and put up in what would eventually become that incredible church where you still see the patriarch serving on Pentecost. This man who started out in the woods where nobody could live with him because it was so difficult, ended up with, of course, one of the most famous monasteries in the world, St. Sergius Holy Trinity Lava. Probably you've all seen it, at least in photographs, if you've not been there. But St. Sergius has a life full of tremendous miracles. Of course, we know as a child he was weeping in his humility because he couldn't read the way other students could, and he couldn't understand things. And there's this famous story, this famous artwork of that even, of this monk appears to him, who turns out to be an angel, he disappears later after he had dines with the family and things, and he gives him this piece of titeron uh, to eat. And once he eats that, he goes into the church not long after that, actually the monk gives him the book to read, and he can read as the wisest man there and understand everything. And from that time on, that is the way he conducted himself in great wisdom and immersing himself in the Fathers and Scriptures. That's what he wanted to be able to do, to understand the things that were most important to the world. He moves out to a monastery. Eventually, when his parents had reposed, his parents, by the way, are both saints, Saint Kirill and Maria. And they, he lives out there with his brother for a while. 
his brother joins him eventually. His brother had family who had died. The wife did. And Stephen couldn't handle that forever. Stephen became an abbot of a monastery eventually, but not, not the way Sergius lived. It's much like Joseph the Hezekiah. It's very few could live with him at first. And eventually 12 disciples join him, and it becomes very similar to the way he was used to living. I mean, as the, the apostles almost. It becomes, I mean, eventually that would become the way it was. The monastery grew and grew. St. Sergius raises a young child from the dead. St. Sergius heals people from demonic possession. People saw angels walking with him in procession. People saw flames encircling him as he communed with the Holy Chalice. Miracle after miracle after miracle. But this, and of course people tried, St. Alexis of Moscow tried to get him to become the next Metropolitan of Moscow. He refused, said he would leave, and they left him alone. A humble man, did not desire worldly power. He only took on the priesthood and the abbacy because he was demanded of the brothers. They needed someone to take care of them, and he had the gifts to do so. But I want to emphasize two things. This man today, the centurion, who said that he was not worthy for Christ to come under his roof, and who ended up having his servant healed, is a kind of man like Sergius. And Sergius believed that about himself, and that's why such miracles poured forth from him, and still to this day, if you once again, some of you have been there, some of you have seen photographs. Thousands upon thousands of people go to his relics. Thousands. There's always lines there. And there's a reason. There's much grace and miracles are worked. But in his life, there's one instance which you might remember which is rather similar to that of St. Moses the Ethiopian. When St. Sergius has a local man, not a man of great means or anything, who comes to see the great Sergius, because his name is spreading far and wide. Remember people in Constantinople come, came to see about Sergius. That's how wide his name spread. Remember there is no Facebook or internet or telephone or anything of that nature at that time. But his name had spread throughout the Christian world. But the man comes to St. St. Sergius and along the road, going near the monastery, he sees this monk dressed essentially in rags. I've seen monks like this. That doesn't make them saints of themselves, but it's, you know, sometimes goes along with it. Somebody's very humble. I've seen monks like this who's cassock. I'm not sure if there's any part of the original cassock left. It's all patches. We all tend to do that in church. It's not appropriate for the liturgy. He wouldn't have done that in liturgy himself. No way. But St. Sergius, he, the man comes to him and he asks him where St. Sergius is, not knowing that he's speaking to Sergius, who's working hard with his hands. That's one thing to point out about St. Sergius and St. Athanasius. They both labored until their death. They worked in every way that the brothers did and constantly labored for the sake of the monastery, but ultimately for the glory of God. And here, this man comes and he sees him, and he leaves him because he tells him something else. He doesn't stay with him. So he goes to the monastery and asks him, and they tell him he's that monk. And of course the man thinks that people are ridiculing him as he tells him that that lowly man is St. Sergius. Oh, I've heard about him. That's not true. You're mocking me. He was furious about this. He kind of mocked the lowly monk. Well, later on, as they were sat at table to eat, and this man was sat in a prominent position himself with the kind of love St. Sergius had. The man sees a prince come up with his entourage and the horses and everything. And he comes in as everybody sort of bows toward this man. And then he is pushed out of the way, since he is not of that kind of nobility. Here comes the prince to St. Sergius and makes a prostration before St. Sergius and kisses his hand. And he goes, who is this man? The man that I saw in rags is that that is St. Sergius. He then began to beg forgiveness, and of course, St. Sergius treated him as if nothing had happened, because St. Sergius had that type of humility, where it's fine with him. He saw himself as a man dressed in rags, and that is why great miracles happened in his life. He had the humility, and God worked in him. There was another instance in his life where St. Sergius says the guide at that monastery, often those kind of people aren't liked, especially when they're strict. And reading St. Sergius's life, I don't see him as particularly strict as some other abbots were. He would go by the cells at night and check on the brothers to see how they were doing.